David Travis, Philip Hodgson. Think like a UX researcher. How to observe users, influence design, and shape business strategy. Ever wondered why some products soar while others flop despite hefty research budgets? One key factor lies in UX research. The seven sins of UX research. Sarah, a seasoned UX researcher, sat in the observation room, watching yet another usability test unfold. The participant, a middle-aged man named Tom, was struggling to complete a seemingly basic task on a new banking app. As Tom fumbled through the interface, muttering under his breath, Sarah noticed the product manager's growing unease. Just ask him what he wants, the manager whispered urgently. We can fix it if we know what he's looking for. Luckily, Sarah ignored him because interfering would have been a mistake. In the realm of user experience research, seven cardinal sins can lead even the most well-intentioned teams astray. Credulity, the first of these sins, occurs when researchers take users' stated preferences at face value without investigating deeper. To combat this, prioritize observing users over directly questioning them. People's actions often speak louder than their words. Dogmatism is the second sin. It's committed when teams stubbornly adhere to a single research methodology, blinding them to valuable insights. The antidote. Flexibility. Try combining qualitative and quantitative approaches to gain a broader understanding of user needs. Bias is sin number three. It creeps in when personal or organizational preferences skew research outcomes, leading to misguided design decisions. To avoid this, tackle your work with an open mind seeking truth rather than validation of pre-existing ideas. The fourth sin, obscurantism, happens when research findings are hoarded within a small group, stifling the spread of user-centric thinking. Counter this by fostering a culture where all team members regularly engage with users, aiming for at least two hours of direct observation every six weeks. Laziness, the fifth deadly sin, manifests as recycling outdated information instead of gathering fresh insights. Embrace an iterative process where you continuously build, measure, learn, and redesign. The sixth sin is vagueness in research objectives. It leads to unfocused efforts and diluted ands. Instead, hone in on specific, high-priority questions. This focused approach yields rich, actionable data that directly informs design decisions. And last but not least, Hubris is the seventh sin. It's the excessive pride researchers take in producing lengthy, complex reports that fail to communicate what they've actually learned. To avoid this, focus on creating concise, visual summaries of your findings. These information radiators make it easy for teams to quickly grasp and act on the most crucial user insights. By recognizing and addressing these seven sins, UX teams can elevate their research practices leading to more user-centered designs and ultimately more successful products and services. Becoming a UX detective. Stuck on a vexing UX question? Try asking yourself, what would Sherlock Holmes do? Let's break UX detective work down into five steps, each echoing Holmes's approach to cracking cases. First, truly understand the problem. Instead of jumping to solutions, craft a clear, specific research question. Like, why are users abandoning our checkout process? Write it down, complete with a question mark. Before diving into any new research, explore your existing knowledge. Conduct archival searches and interview stakeholders to gather background information. Next, collect the facts through keen observation. Don't just ask users what they want, watch what they do. Pay attention to small details the seemingly insignificant actions or frustrations that users themselves might overlook. View each observation with an open mind, free from preconceptions. At this stage, focus on gathering information, not interpreting it. With the facts in hand, it's time to develop hypotheses. Draw on your expertise in human behavior, technology trends, and business goals to interpret your observations. Create detailed personas and user journeys that explain not just what users do, but why they do it. As you develop potential solutions, eliminate unlikely hypotheses. Evaluate each idea against the facts you've collected. Does it truly address the observed behavior and user needs? 
leverage prototypes and experiments to test your theories, refining them through iterative design. Finally, act on your solution. This involves presenting clear findings to stakeholders and development teams. Provide specific, actionable recommendations and establish accountability for their implementation. Stay involved and promote ongoing testing and refinement. Throughout this process, remember the golden rule of both detectives and UX researchers. Never act on assumptions alone. Always search for facts and base decisions on solid evidence. By thinking like a detective, you'll uncover the clues that lead to truly user-centered designs, solving the mystery of what users really need, even when they can't articulate it themselves. Defining your research question. Anne stared at the whiteboard, marker in hand, ready to jot down the team's research question. The room fell silent. Despite weeks of planning and a hefty budget, no one could express exactly what they were trying to learn. This scene, all too common in UX research, highlights an important truth. Without a clear definition of your problem, even the most expensive study can fall flat. Defining the research problem is the cornerstone of effective UX research. Yet many companies pour millions into studies that merely reinforce what they already know. To avoid this trap, savvy researchers employ a toolkit of techniques to sharpen their focus. First, they cast a wide net, consulting stakeholders across the organization. From marketers to engineers, each team member brings a unique perspective that can illuminate hidden facets of the problem. By understanding each team's needs, constraints and goals, researchers can craft questions that really get at what matters. Next, they take abstract concepts and make them concrete. Quality, usability, user satisfaction. Each of these isn't a single thing, but a complex construct begging to be unpacked. By breaking these down into measurable components, researchers transform vague ideas into concrete metrics. This process often involves diving into existing literature and standards, ensuring their approach is grounded in solid theory. Equipped with these components, the focus shifts to measurement. What specific data points will reveal the answers you seek? How will you differentiate between concepts or levels of variables? This step forces researchers to think critically about their methodology, balancing subjective and objective measures to paint a complete picture. Finally, wise researchers never skip the dress rehearsal. Pilot studies, both informal pre-pilots and more structured tests, serve as reality checks. They reveal hidden assumptions, uncover logistical hiccups, and often bring to light stakeholders or issues that were initially overlooked. By including team members in these pilots, you can both refine your method and build buy-in for the final study. This meticulous problem-defining process might seem time-consuming, but when you cut corners, you lose out in the long run. Knowing exactly what you're trying to solve is the difference between research that gathers dust and insights that drive innovation. Secondary research and stakeholder interviews. Now let's look at two crucial stages of UX research, desk research and stakeholder interviews. Desk research, also known as secondary research, is the first step in any UX project. It's about reviewing existing research findings to gain a broad understanding of the research question. This approach is quick and cost-effective, allowing you to build upon previous work and avoid reinventing the wheel. Think of a Venn diagram with three overlapping circles, users, goals, and environments. The sweet spot for UX research lies where all three intersect, but insights can also be found in the areas where only two circles overlap. This might include surveys about users and their goals, analytics data on goals and environments, or field research on users in their environments. To conduct effective desk research, start by exploring resources within your organization. Then, branch out to external sources such as government statistics, charity research, academic studies, and career interviews. When evaluating research findings, don't dismiss older studies outright. Human behavior often changes slowly, and past research may still offer relevant insights. Stakeholder interviews are also critical for setting projects up for success. Rather than simply accepting stakeholders' proposed solutions, Skilled UX researchers use structured techniques to uncover the real issues at hand. The process begins by moving away from the solution, 
redirecting the conversation from requested deliverables to the underlying problems. Probe stakeholders to find out their goals and what they hope to achieve. Next, work to uncover all relevant issues and generate a comprehensive list of problems or desired outcomes. This may involve using techniques like sticky notes for group input to prevent discussions from becoming chaotic. Only begin prioritizing issues once this list is compiled. Another step in stakeholder interviews is developing strong, credible evidence. How sure are you that each problem is genuine? Categorize evidence as either non-existent, soft, presumed, or hard. If the evidence is lacking, you can offer assistance in gathering data. Quantifying the problem's impact and the potential value of a solution helps establish the project's importance. It's also important to explore context and constraints in stakeholder interviews. This involves investigating the problem's history, previous attempts at solving it, and any obstacles that may hinder progress. Are there any constraints from the past that no longer apply? The goal here is to create a clear picture of the project landscape. There's one final secret to productive stakeholder interviews. Thorough preparation. Inform stakeholders in advance about the meeting's structure and ensure that decision makers with the proper authority will be in attendance. This approach not only yields essential information, but also creates a strong first impression, demonstrating that you can tackle complex problems strategically. Design Ethnography Looking for a powerful research method that provides deep insights into users' needs, goals and behaviours. Enter Design Ethnography. Unlike traditional ethnography, which aims to understand entire cultures, Design Ethnography focuses on extracting actionable design conclusions. To do this, researchers typically spend days or weeks observing and interacting with users in their natural environments. The core of design ethnography revolves around answering key questions. What goals are the users trying to achieve? How do they accomplish tasks? What do users find particularly satisfying or frustrating? By observing users in context, design ethnographers can identify both the difficulties users encounter and the workarounds they've developed. This approach often reveals insights that users themselves may not articulate in traditional interviews or surveys. To conduct effective design ethnography, there are some common pitfalls to avoid. One is relying on inappropriate research methods in the field, such as surveys or concept testing. This isn't what design ethnography is after, which is rich, high contextual data. Another error is failing to distinguish between users' stated opinions and their observable behaviors. These often differ quite a lot. The ethnographic interview is a cornerstone of this research approach, and its success hinges on conducting it in the user's natural environment. This lets you observe nuances in behavior that users might not think to mention or may be unaware of themselves. The interview process typically unfolds in stages, beginning with building rapport between the researcher and participant. This is followed by a transition to a master-apprentice model where the researcher positions themselves as a learner eager to understand the participant's world. Observation forms the bulk of the research, with researchers watching participants' actions and asking clarifying questions. This is where the real findings often emerge, as you notice subtle behaviours and workarounds that participants may take for granted. Then, the interpretation stage involves verifying assumptions and conclusions with the participant making sure that your understanding aligns with the user's reality. After the session comes the summarization stage, where you gather insights while they're still fresh. A good way to do this is to write notes on index cards, which you can then reference during your later analysis. That way, you'll be able to differentiate between participants and preserve their immediate impressions. Critical thinking for researchers. Did you know that an estimated 90% of new products fail within their first six months on the market? Why is that? Well, there's a number of possible reasons. It may be inadequate market assessment or targeting the wrong audience. Sometimes, weak positioning strategies or suboptimal product attributes doom a launch from the start. Pricing miscalculations, ineffective advertising campaigns, and even cannibalization of existing product lines can all contribute to a product's downfall. Ironically, some potentially viable products are abandoned prematurely, 
cutting short what might have been a successful run with more patience and refinement. One of the most insidious threats to product success is the phenomenon of collective belief. This occurs when an organization develops an unwavering faith in a project's inevitable success, creating an echo chamber that discourages critical thought. This blind faith prevents teams from seeing warning signs, leading them down a path to failure. To combat these challenges, product teams can benefit from adopting a more scientific approach to their work. One set of tools is Carl Sagan's Baloney Detection Kit, which offers strategies for rigorous analysis. At the heart of this method is the importance of confirming facts. Teams should independently verify information and require solid evidence for claims, rather than relying on assumptions or hearsay. It's also crucial to question authority and recognize that expertise doesn't guarantee infallibility. No matter how respected a team member or leader might be, their ideas should still be subject to scrutiny. Another key principle is to develop multiple hypotheses. Instead of latching onto a single idea, teams should consider various explanations or solutions and then systematically test them. This approach helps prevent tunnel vision and increases their chances of finding the best possible solution. The principle of Occam's razor, favoring simpler explanations when they're equally supported by evidence, can be a valuable guide in product development. It encourages teams to avoid unnecessary complexity in both their products and their reasoning. By implementing these critical thinking tools early in the design and research process, especially during ideation and concept formation, you can exponentially boost your chances of success.